by the minute, and we're stuck inside speaking about ancient woodlands, we're all in our own houses and stuff, and I uh, thought it might be nice just to refresh ourselves as to what it, what it is that we're speaking about. So there's three separate slides. Um, so this is a, an ancient ashwood. This is most northerly ashwood in the UK. It's at a place called Rassel in the northwest of Scotland. And part of what's really interesting about ancient woodlands for me is, yeah, sure, the trees, because without the trees, there is no woodland, but it's all the non-tree parts of the wood. So mosses and the lichens and the, the ground flora and the fungi, and it's the shape and the color and the texture. Um, they're very special places to be in. And there's, there are no two that are exactly the same. And I think that's really quite important when it comes to assessing how we manage these places and be the same when we come to talk about pods. Um, so although we have some principles and how we manage stuff, it's really, things have to be quite site specific. So uh, it's an image of Russell Ashwood. It's one of the few limestone woods we've got in Scotland. Um, I know you have much better examples probably in the south of Cumbria, but uh, we could go on to the next slide. So here's another beautiful place. This is Crinan Wood, which is in the a southwest of Argyll in Scotland. It's a bit more acidic than the limestone wood with the ash I've just shown you earlier. Um, but again, you can see that you've got that mosaic of form and texture and colour. And in the foreground of the picture, there's a nice old veteran oak um, with lots of different niches for different types of things to, to find a space to live. Okay. And really quite, a, it's a lush, wet kind of wood. So if we can move on to the next slide. And this is further west still. This is in the Isle of Mull. Uh, it's an ancient hazel wood. It would rightly be described as a temperate rainforest, a really, really high in rainfall. And it's a funny place because when you view it from a distance, it doesn't look like anything. It just looks like a wee scrappy bit of scrub that you could barely walk in. But actually, you can easily walk in it. When you duck under the canopy and you walk in it, it's really quite a magical place. Hey, in terms of ground flora, it's a bit more similar to the ashwood from the first picture. You'll see that this was taken in the spring with lots of ransoms or a wild garlic on the, on the understory there, the ground flora. A, one of many uh, ancient woodland indicator species. So th the purpose really of starting the talk with these was just to re-emphasize that they are special places from lots of different perspectives and that they're, they're not homogenous things. And when we speak about ancient woodland, they're really quite a varied subject, varied topic. Go on to the next slide. So hey, nobody knows exactly the extent of the woodland cover in the UK, but it probably it's fair to say that it was the dominant natural ecosystem post-glacial UK, probably reached its height or its zenith about 5,000 years ago or so. And people vary in terms of what they think, but roughly about 78% perhaps of the land would have been wooded at that time. And unfortunately now, we have just over 2% of the land, which are ancient woodland sites, uh, and almost half of that are plantations on ancient woodland sites. So just over 1% of our land is ancient semi-natural woodland, and that's by no means all in pristine conditions. So quite a lot of that, various issues around it with invasives or um, high browse and pressures, and maybe they're not as, maybe, uh, not as in good condition as they should be. Next slide, please. So I just thought I'd pop in a couple of maps for a bit of visuals on what 2% looks like. So the darker areas in this map, this is taken from the Ancient Woodland Inventory. So the Ancient Woodland Inventory was a, a distribution of ancient woodlands that was determined from a map-based exercise in the 1980s, where people looked at sites that were known to have been wooded from old maps. In the case of England, it was maps around 1600s or thereabouts. And if the site was wooded at that time and it's wooded now, then it's considered to have been an ancient woodland site. Um, 
they did only look at sites that were greater than two hectares, so lots of smaller fragments are missing. But the yes, the main thing I wanted you to see from this was that the vast majority of the land is not ancient woodland. Um, so it's really quite a sparse resource and it's quite a fragmented resource. And in the north of England, there's probably two little hotspots. There's one on the east coast in the North York Moors there. And then the other one's in the south of Cumbria there on the west side, which you'll recognise, of course. And if we can move on to the next slide, please, Claire. So this is just a close-up of the, the area of South Cumbria with the ancient woodland inventory sites marked on it. And I wanted to show you, the, particularly if we focus in on just the middle of that picture of the frame there, you see that the in that particular area, that's significantly more than 2% of the, of the land mass. And so you're in quite a privileged position uh, in South of Cumbria. But with that comes a certain amount of responsibility, I think, in that if and when you can make a difference, you make a difference locally, which is important, but you also make a difference to the national picture, but you've got a dis disproportionate influence, I think, uh, because of the distribution of the site. Next slide, please. So this is the deliberate mistake slide, I guess. Um, but I thought it was important we'd, if we're speaking about there's been a loss of ancient woodland, well, why, why would that matter? And I think it's, it's worth taking a minute to think about that. So. Okay, so these are the submissions we had from you um, today um, in answer to the question, why is ancient woodland important? So thanks very much for submitting those and feel free to submit any further ideas via the chat function and Neville will collect those for us. Um, so I'll start top left. Complex, well-established ecosystem often home to rare species, destroy it, and potential to lose species and disrupt system. Also beautiful. So got the aesthetic in there as well. Wealth of biodiversity it's capable of holding. Biodiversity and carbon sequestration. Seed banks, more biodiversity. Talking about the system um, and the complexity providing resilience and something that is of its place. Alan, do you want to have a look at some of these? Is this something yeah. that you've, you've come across before when you've done? Talks like yeah, this. well, I have to say, uh, clearly speaking, with a uh, quite a learned audience, um, <laughs> but yeah, that I think that for me, the 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 bits up on the screen just now captured the the essence of why it's important. Um, I, I kind of jotted down last night. Uh, I, I guess I sort of brainstorm on it and a, a range of different things. So maybe I'll just rattle through these in just a minute or so and just try and uh, open out some of the other reasons why ancient woodland might be uh, something of value. So yeah, biologically diverse, in fact, our richest uh, terrestrial habitat or ecosystem is uh, ancient woodlands. Home for rare and threatened species, a scarce resource that's irreplaceable, uh, often with archeological features, um, maybe with unknown features that are waiting to be discovered. And so if we lose them, then we lose that, that potential for, for new knowledge. Um, opportunities for biological recording, opportunities for education, opportunities for research and interdisciplinary cooperation, a place of beauty and inspiration, physical and mental well-being, a source of folklore and stories, um, a connection to place names and meaning, um, an opportunity to reinvigorate coppice and culture, um, maybe both for con excuse me, <laughs> conservation process purposes, but also for 
for purposes of woodland craftspeople, um, possibilities for making charcoal, herbs, medicines, dyes, um, foraging, mosses, mushrooms, berries, flowers, uh, potential to earn income from it, potential for employment, potential to uh, generate timber, uh, important for recreation and tourism, possible for hunting, for game habitat, opportunities for wood pasture, a, a place of shelter, that's both for humans and potentially for animals or for livestock. Uh, sites that potentially we could get grant support for maintenance of, um, involved in carbon sequestration, improving water quality, a useful improving air quality, um, helpful in controlling flooding, helpful in controlling soil erosion. And then just the final two that in some ways, they, one of the things that intrigues me most maybe is these two is that they're both a link to our past and therefore to our ancestors. Um, and so when you walk in them and you get that feeling, we're connecting and you get that feeling of these are special places, they're beautiful, they're lovely, it makes you feel good. Um, my guess is that the people that came before us had that same feelings when they were walking. And following on from that, they're also a link to our future and what we leave behind as a legacy. So we have a responsibility for those of us that see these places as having something of value. We have a responsibility to leave a legacy for people coming after us. So the folk that can come after us get the same feelings that we've had and that our ancestors have had. So quite a wide range of ways in which I think ancient woodland day has value. So there are lots yeah. of things that you've mentioned, Alan, and the submissions that we've had today from the audience. Um, a, a key um, um, measure seems to be the continuity. So continuity of habitat or, or, or continuity of the woodland seems to be where a lot of the value is. Uh, you know, in the biodiversity and also the archaeology and the history and that uh, ancient kind of human connection to the woodland. Undoubtedly, and I think it is, it's because of that continuity and that antiquity that you, you end up forming, there's lots of, in, in Scotland we would say little nooks and crannies evolve, you know, so lots of different types of ecological niches become available, which in a younger woodland, which is more simple, just isn't the case. Um, even just the, an individual ancient tree, you'll find some bits of it that are in the sun, some bits that are in the shade, some bits that are holding water, some bits that are drier. You'll have some things that have acid bark, some things that have alkaline bark. Uh, you'll have rock holes and hollows, you'll have nesting sites, you'll have places for bats. It's, and it's, it's that continuity in time and space that's allowed that to happen. Um, and we can't, I suppose an important point I think is that we can't, if we lose, as we lose these places, we can't instantly um, remake them because they only are what they are because of the, that continuity. So I think that is the key. Uh, yeah, I think uh, I'll just butt in here and say they can be quite easily broken and it's quite a hard thing to repair in a way, isn't it? So. I find uh, with the work that we've done over the years, you can go to a woodland and bits of it can be marvellous and just, just across the wall, it can be in quite a poor state and it's the same woodland that maybe has been just broken up over the years. And um, even in 15, 20 years, the sort of health doesn't necessarily transfer over the wall uh, to Im improve it to what it could have been. So it, it all takes time. And that if that continuity is broken, then uh, yes, it, it, it uh, takes a while to get back. So, yes. Anybody interested in a bit of extra reading about that might want to um, look at some of Oliver Rackham's books. Um, and Neville, was there anything in the chat that you thought we might want to come in with now, or should we save it till the, uh, um, after the second half of Alan's presentation? So just two quick points, Claire, which build on stuff that we've already talked about. So Carrie says uh, they just feel wonderful to be in. I can't explain it any better than that. And Andrew says unique living spaces that connect us to the past, the present and the future. So really just underlining what Alan was saying, I think.
That's great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to go back to the second half of your presentation, if you're ready. Martin. Okay. okay, I think we could skip that with we've, we've, we've kind of we've kind of got to the crux of the matter, I think. So the second half of the talk will be on plantations and ancient woodland sites. So these are sites that used to be these very special places, but are now in some way degraded, um, some very heavily so, uh, some much less so. And I've asked the question, are all pause sites the same? And clearly the answer is going to be no to that in the same way as all ancient woodland sites aren't the same. Um, and largely the condition of the pause site will be dependent on the plantation species of choice. So if you have a dense plantation of something like Sitka spruce or Douglas fir, where there's very little light gets down to the ground, uh, to the woodland floor, then you'll find that much of the interest of the ancient woodland sites, so all the flowering plants, the wasps and the kins, in some cases, the fungi and obviously the original trees, a lot of them lost, been lost. Um, it also depends a little bit on the subsequent management. So if you have, so going back to the, you know, the plantation species of choice, if you had a, a species of choice where it, like larch, for example, or you had a wood that had been regularly thinned and there's more light gets down through to the woodland floor, then probably in slightly better condition than the ones that have very little light get through. So the, the key to restoration of these sites is often related to manipulation of the light levels and generally speaking we would try and do that in a gradual manner um, so that the conditions within the wood for the woodland specialist plant is changed in a slowly so they don't get get some kind of shock uh, and potentially if you opened up too quickly then we might suffer from desiccation or something um, so i would say that some sites have um, a very clear potential for restoration because they've got a half decent starter plant already got some good remnants and other sites in much less good condition but they still have some potential still take them on a journey today of improvement of ecological condition and even the sites that look the most trashed will probably still have important processes happening in the soil that wouldn't be present in woodlands that don't have that and have that a duration in the same space we could get the next slide So again, I just thought I'd illustrate this with a series of photographs. I'll just whip through these quite quickly. So this was a site in Highland Park. It was a, with Norway spruce and Sitka spruce. It's actually pre-plantation. It would have been very similar to the first slide that I showed you of the ancient ashwood up at um, Brassel. It's a base rich site and it would have had been very similar characteristics. And you can see that there's very little of that those ancient woodland features are present. So the heavier the shade, the poorer the condition is likely. Next slide, please. So where there's some light penetrates the woodland floor, so whether that's where that there's a little opening, so it might be that the, when they planted the site, they didn't plant it right up to a water course or something. So you might have a wee bit of light coming through there. Um, or it might be that the, the site's been planted with non-native coniferous, but it's been regularly thinned, and so the legs come through there. So in those situations, you tend to have a slightly better starter pack in terms of where to go for restorations. And these bits, so you can see the, the green bit there, where there's it's actually a result of a, a little bit of wind blow, I think, in this occasion, uh, and a couple of the plantation trees having died, and so there's a bit more light. So we now have some woodland ground flora. And that acts as a hot spot from which we can work out eh, when we get involved in the nitty gritty of making decisions about restoration. We have the next slide, please. So sometimes within the plantation, you the, the plantation species of choice is a native species. So in this case, it's an island persia and it's Scots pine. I'm conscious that Scots pine is not native to your part of the world, but you will have 
pause sites where oaks being the plantation species of choice. In this case, on this slide, uh, we've got a native species and we've got native ground flora, but they don't match. So the, the pine have been planted on a site that wouldn't naturally have held pine, but would have naturally held birch and oak. So although it's got quite a lot to work from in terms of restoration, it's not the ancient semi-natural woodland that would have been there that would have had all those direct connections from things having co-evolved. Um, so slightly diff better condition than the previous slides, but still some work to do. Next slide, please. And this is a similar thing. Again, it's an illustration because that's why I come across most in the highlands of Scotland. Um, this is from not far from where Neville stays, uh, Methy Bridge in the Cairngorms. But this is a, a site where a native plant, native species has been used as plantation species of choice, and it's site native, so it suits the ground conditions. It's the same type of uh, habitat. So we've, we're in really quite a good position here. Uh, there are still issues. Um, we, if you look at it, there's not much species diversity, there's not much structural diversity, and the two ancient granny pines that are sitting there are beginning to get at risk of being overshaded by the younger pine, Scots pine plantation. So this type of site's in better condition than certainly the, the earlier images that I showed you, but even here, there's still some work to be done. So the work that we need to do uh, is dependent on what we find. So when Jamie comes out and assesses the condition of the site, his recommendations will be based on what's actually on the ground which is to do with what was planted there in the first place, how it's been managed subsequently, um, and what remnant features we have left. So next slide. So when Jamie's out, uh, so in the initial thing you'll be looking for is visible remnant features of the ancient woodland. Um, and they're under the four categories below. And the uh, reason that we'll be looking for that then is partly because they're of interest in their own right, they uh, have value in their own right because of the fact that the remnants of the old wood, but they're also um, act as a proxy for things that might be less visible. So it may be that there are things happening in the soil that's associated with that, that's in slightly better condition than elsewhere, or, and there's a couple of slides later on, well, suggest some other a things that we can, we can use one of these features as proxy for other things of interest. So just go on to the next slide. So this is a fairly impressive pre-plantation tree with yours truly standing at the base of it. This is in a Loch Arbor in Scotland on the west coast, quite close to Loch Arcade. It's a monstrous old oak, um, stunning individual tree. But, and there's been some restoration work started here. So the, the adjacent the plantation was planted right up to and, in, and underneath the, out, the, the branches of the old oak. And so they've been taken out gradually in two or three uh, little tranches. And so we've let more light in. Uh, a couple of years later, a little bit more light in, and the trees respond in reasonably well. Um, so you may not always find quite as grand versions of, of this. That's one of the most impressive trees I've seen in a pause plantation, but that's what I mean by pre-plantation pre trees. Next slide. So we'd also be looking for large woody debris and old stumps. And in part that's because it's, a, it's further evidence of the fact that the ancient woodland site is indeed ancient. So I mentioned the ancient woodland inventory earlier and it's a good starter, good starter for determining where ancient woodlands is, but it is a flawed document. So you have to kind of ground truth the fact that there is an ancient woodland. So you're looking for remnant things that give you that idea. And the fact that you've got a large, a fallen stem there of a tree that was probably two or three hundred years old before it fell 
and has maybe been lying there a couple of hundred years, gives you the impression that alongside various other things within the woodland, that is indeed an ancient woodland site. And when I was speaking about these the idea of some of these things that we're looking for being valuable in their own right, but also being proxy for other things, I think this is a good example because we would often talk about a fallen stem like that as a piece of dead wood. But when I look at it, it's by no means dead. It's absolutely chock full of life. And it's chock full of all kinds of different life. And even if I, you can't uh, identify what all the different species are, you can pick out that there are a lot of different things there because they've got different colour, texture and form. And there will also be things that are operating within the, the fallen, decaying wood there that we can't see at all. There may well be, a, well, undoubtedly will be fungal associates there, which for large parts of the year will be invisible to our eye. There may also be dead wood invertebrates, some really specialist things will be involved in that. So really quite important to keep an eye out for, for features like that. Next slide. And so the next thing we'd be looking for is sort of woodland specialist plants. So some of these, the, all of these plants in these photos would be described as ancient woodland indicators. So some of the fussier plants take a while to get there, uh, and they only really tend to be present in the ancient woodland sites where they've had that, they've had that continuity, and they've therefore had the opportunity for the, uh, that wide range of niche habitats to evolve, and uh, they've, they're able to find a place to make a living, as it were. So going from left to right, um, the strange looking thing on the far left is a thing called um, hazel gloves. It's only ever found it in old growth forests. Um, the, the old growth hazel forest anyway. The next slide along is a uh, longwort, so it's a lichen again. Tends only to be found in ancient woodland sites and also actually in places with decent air quality. Um, the next slide along it's a moss that's found in an ancient woodland indicator for upland and acid sites. It's got a common name, which is unusual for mosses. It's an ost ostrich feather moss, but Tilium crista cristansis is its formal name. It's a beautiful little thing when you see it. Um, and then on the right hand side of the slide, um, you also have a flowering plants. So, on this occasion, it's woodruff, and woodruff would be an ancient indicator. Each woodland indicator for base rich sites, so where you might have ash and elm or um, potentially hazel. And you would find it alongside things like dog's mercury and, and Turner's nightshade, various other indicators. Uh, next slide, please. And last but by no means, as we mentioned in the, the, the discussion about sort of the value of ancient woodland, part of it is, there, is connecting to the people that came before us. And there are often cultural and archaeological features that are present in wood. We ought to be able to look after these as well, um, because again, they are linked to our past. And like, so some of them are really quite obvious. So on the one on the right hand side, you can see that that's a sort of man made structure of sorts. It's actually from a, a wood that Edward Mills, who I believe is doing one of the talks later on in this wee series, uh, he's doing a talk on uh, rhododendron clearance. But, um, anyway, it's from a wood that he manages at Chapel House, and Ed thinks that it's uh, was a hut for itinerant workers. It's the most likely explanation for it. And then on the left hand side, you also sometimes come across features that are much less clear, and you just notice there's a sort of small indentation. In, in the sort of the, the right hand side of the left hand image, as it were. Um, it's a little bit akin to a charcoal platform or something, but it doesn't look quite like that uh, to my eyes. And, and Ed thought that it was most likely to be to do with um, creating potash. But anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a remnant feature of giving evidence that people have worked in the wood. 
uh, previously. So these are things that we would also be looking out for, trying to ensure that we can maintain them in reasonable condition. Next slide. So we're nearly at the end of the presentation. I think this is the third last slide, so almost on to like where we can have a chat and some questions. Um, so I don't think I can emphasize enough the one at the top there that these ancient woods are complex and that they're irreplaceable. We can't instantly recreate them. And I think that's fundamental to the whole subject matter. The next thing is that without some kind of intervention, quite a number of pause sites will become irrever irreversibly degraded. If we don't intervene and allow a little bit more light into them, then they're just going to become in worse and worse condition. And the journey then to a restored route is uh, going to be much, much longer. Having said that, all pause have some kind of value. Uh, some are obviously in better condition than others, but they will also all have something, uh, even if it's things that we can't necessarily see. Um, management of light levels, key to the whole thing. It's the key to the whole thing. And then something that Jamie mentioned earlier, um, we have to recognise and understand that restoration is a long-term process. Um, when you see something as being urgent, and I think there is an urgency to start this kind of work, um, there's a tendency for us to want it all done yesterday. It's just not possible with anything to do with management of trees or woodlands or considering the, the ecology of woodlands. All, it's always going to be a long-term process. But if we, if we make a start, then we can build on that start and continue to, to progress things. Next slide. So when it comes to actually doing work in the wood to try and make a difference, to try and uh, activate some kind of restoration process, the first part of that, first phase of that work would generally be considered what I would think of as first aid. So we're trying to stop the, any further decline. So in the case where you saw the big old oak where I was standing at the foot of it, what they've done there is they've gone in and they've taken out what, what would be described as halo thin, and they've taken out just a handful of the trees that were surrounding the old trees, a handful of the plantation trees were surrounding the old tree, and given it a little bit of breathing space, effectively. You would do something similar with the image that showed of the pause site that just had a little bit of green where there'd been some a wind blow, and you had some, some woodland ground flora present then these act as places from which we can work out. So you would then maybe do a little bit of thin and work around them, let them eke their way back into the woods. So the first part of the restoration process is, I guess, after you've done the survey and you've made an assessment of what condition the site is, is the first aid. The next part of the process is a progression to a semi-natural canopy. And where possible, I would generally try to encourage people to do that in a, in a gradual manner. A, often through repeated uh, little and often thinnings. So you're changing the environment within the woodland slowly. Uh, so there's no shock to any of the woodland specialists that, that are there. Um, and you're letting a little bit more light in. You're hopefully getting a little bit more ground flora uh, present. You're maybe beginning to get some natural uh, regeneration of native trees in the understory. So you're basically trying to make the woodland a little bit more robust. So when you, if, if and when we come to the point where you take out the remaining of non-native trees, the, it's been in a wooded environment, albeit in a, often in a non-native wooded environment, plantation, but it's been in a wooded environment, uh, so they've managed to persist, and when they get the chance, they can then flourish. And then the third part of the restoration process, and this would maybe be something that would be most applicable, so in when we looked at the pause sites in different condition and the last slide showed a couple of veteran granny pines that were on a site native site. So there were native trees and they were on the right kind of site. And um, so you're really just looking at the, the final phases of that. And what you're trying to do in these sort of circumstances 
is improve the ecological health and resilience of the woodland. So you're maybe looking at things like, do we have both species and structural diversity? Um, have we managed to eradicate or minimize any invasive plants such as rhododendron or others? Um, what's the level of deer browse? Are there young trees beginning to establish? And if there are, is it only the unpalatable young trees that are beginning to establish? Or do we also have the palatable trees beginning to establish? And um, so you're beginning to think about the long-term sustainable management of the, of the wood. Um, so just the final slide, we can get on with a bit of a discussion. And so just to finish, um, we emphasize again, ancient woodland diverse and irreplaceable. We can't, if we lose it, we can't instantly recreate it. So we need to do what we can, both on the ancient semi-natural and pause stuff. The fact that almost half of ancient woodland sites are plantations in ancient woodland is disappointing in lots of ways. But what it does mean is that um, restoring pause can make a genuine difference to our re resource, both locally and nationally. If you could get all the pause sites into half decent condition, a and more akin to what the natural world would have provided in those kind of spaces, and we could almost double our, our ancient woodland resorts. Um, there are some principles that underpin restoration, so that sort of gradual process is quite an important thing. The manipulation of light levels is quite an important thing. But I've said a couple of times, and Jamie mentioned as well, it's one of his interventions that, um, the management recommendations really do have to be site specific. That's the value of having somebody like Jamie who knows the area, um, knows the subject matter, can walk about in the wood and accurately assess what kind of condition it is, and then determine appropriate ways to try and move, move things forward. Um, and then finally, um, just, to sub that, just to reiterate again that all sites have some ecological value. Some will be in better condition than others, but they all have some ecological value. In all cases, with appropriate management, the condition can be improved. And although it's not always the case, the work that can be undertaken can also be economically viable, which is quite important in dealing with private landowners. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'll let clear take the chair as it were again continue on the evenings event thanks very much wonderful thanks so much alan um that was brilliant and uh really good pace to that i had time to absorb i'm going to stop sharing my screen now so we're going to go back to the grid of of happy woodland loving faces there we go okay so we've got um nearly 15 minutes now for um, some questions. If anybody um, had any questions, Neville may have been collecting those to pose to um, Alan and Jamie and indeed the floor. I'll, so I hand over to you, Neville. That would be good, thank you. Sorry, I got lost in screen world there. Uh, so there were two question, questions. I'll do those in the order that they uh, came in. If I can scroll up in the uh, chat. Uh, Angela Smith asked a question about uh, plantations on wood, ancient woodland sites. Angela, shall I, do you want to unmute yourself and... Uh, pose your question to Alan and Jamie. Yeah. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Sometimes I sound like a Dalek on here. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, uh, um, I don't know much about ancient woodlands at all, but I'd seen the, the talk and was interested, so hence I've come along. Um, but I was wondering why, um, what sort of controls there are on the planted woodland sites, um, how they have been 
how that's that's happened that they have the ancient woodland sites have been planted and what sort of legislation or legislative controls there might be to protect other ancient woodlands from being planted hey, so the plantations in ancient woodland sites came about really as after post-war felons when there was a desire to be self-sufficient in timber and so there was a lot of um, both woodland creation uh, on generally less good ground um, but as well as establishing new woodlands in order to be self-sufficient uh, they also felled a lot of ancient woodlands and planted them generally with faster growing exotic conifers and that was the rationale for it. In fact uh, quite a lot of the was was generated by the organisation that should be looking after our forests, or the main kind of state organisation, which is the, the Forestry Commission. Um, but in their favour, uh, or in their defence anyway, um, they were tasked with establishing a, a timber resource for the nation, as it were. That was the rationale for why it happened. In terms of um, protection, there's no protection for ancient woodland sites per se. Um, some sites may have a, a sites of special scientific interest, so they may have some protection because of that. Some individual trees may have tree preservation orders on something, but ancient woodlands per se are not protected. Um, but the management of them in the UK forestry guidance, there are certain things that you have, you're meant to do if you own them at least, and that's in the first instance, not to allow them to deteriorate any further and preferably to actively try and manage them to improve their condition. But there, uh, there's, these places do deserve some kind of um, protection, I think. Um, they're special and they are under all sorts of threat, not just the pause stuff, but for ancient semi-natural woodlands, you know, they're, they're often very fragmented um, they're pretty scarce, and you know, if if a woodland's really fragmented, it's not going to have all the constituent parts to it, and it's going to be so much more vulnerable to any external pressures. And then, certainly on the west side of the country, you've got issues with rhododendron, which will be um, causing problems in ancient semi-natural woodlands, and, and certainly throughout Scotland, and I think in large parts of England too, the levels of deer pressure are totally unsustainable. So there's significant Neville? threats even for the best. Sorry. Neville, I think you, you need to be on mute. Oh, okay, sorry. I was just gonna come in there and add to that as well, if that's okay. So I think there are two things that I'd say that the carrot the the state does have some carrots and it does have some sticks. So the felling license controls stop people felling without consent. And then there are a range of incentives that the state have that encourage uh, better and sound management of those woodlands. Sorry, I'll go back onto the mute now. I'll, I'll add a bit to there. Um, that it's, uh, I guess the question is, are they still being replaced with plantations? So often you'll find the existent ancient semi-natural woodland, well, around here at any rate, is not likely to be replaced by a plantation in the current sort of day. Um, it's more that has happened in the past. But what you do tend to find is, is if it's existent as a plantation, so uh, pause, plantation on an ancient woodland site, that often then does still remain as a plantation on an ancient woodland site. So people are still quite hungry for conifer and keen to keep planting that. Um, so one of the things that we tend to try and persuade people to do is just think about the species that they're then putting back in, um, say after a thin or a clear fell or something, to improve the woodland in the longer term. So it's a, it's a, it can be an incredibly slow game to try and uh, restore woodlands that way, but at least it's, it's improving it um, rather than sort of degrading it further. So, so yeah, it's, uh, that's sort of one way to do it too. Neville, did you have another question lined up? 
I did apologies for the background noise trying to be at a PTA meeting and uh, on this Zoom meeting as well. Um, so there was a question from Patricia about uh, will um, uh, Phytophthora remorum, so that's the disease that's affecting and killing larch trees, be a friend of plantations on ancient woodland sites? Ooh. <laughs> That's probably uh, topical for the West Coast, at least. So uh, we find <coughs> larch is a good tree for pores. I think, as, as Alan was saying before, because it's sort of quite lightly shading. And um, you find that it, uh, it means that your light levels underneath are, are good and you can have some good ancient woodland features that cope quite well with larch as a crop, even in a pure stand of larch. So, Yes, but however, the Phytophthora uh, comes with an enforcement, which means the whole lot has to come out. So, um, and that's a statutory sort of enforcement, which means it's it's a legally sort of bound situation. Um, so, and that normally has a, a, a wide area too. So it does depend a little bit on the makeup of the woodland, uh, but you've, you potentially have sort of up to or in excess of 100 meters uh, radius or area. Uh, that, that has to be sort of clear felled in effect and that can then be sort of damaging by comparison to what was there um, and then looking here it says in relation to um, where by, by way of using it as a restoration tool um, yeah I think I think it's possibly more of a threat than the other way around so yes because you 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 have to then act on it whereas if, if you could use larch uh, sort of more continually, you can gradually thin and sort of move towards your native species that way, which would be preferable. So, yeah. yes, I think it's more risky than not. And then it mentions here about uh, threatening the ancient woodland by infecting oak, but I believe that's a different sort of phytophthora. So well, I might be wrong, but I think it is, unless anyone knows otherwise. The sudden oak death, is it? Is that the one that's being referred to? I'm not sure. Phytophthora remorum has been found in lots of different species, uh, but normally it's, uh, it's, it, it won't kill a tree and it won't, uh, it won't spread. So at the moment, it's not, it's not infecting lots of oaks. I mean, it's even been found on Sitka spruce in really unusual situations, but uh, it's pretty unlikely. But it has made species jumps before. So uh, that's the thing to worry about, I guess, if you want to worry about something else. I'll, uh, I'll go to the next question in the chat, which is, Andrew, um, are you happy to vocalise your question and then everybody won't have to listen to the PTA meeting while I do it? Um, yes, uh, Neville, and uh, thank you, everybody. Um, just calling in from uh, Ireland, where we also have some... Point, well, 0.2% left of ancient woodlands. And we have, well, definition, old woodland sites, plantations on old woodland sites, uh, 27,000 hectares identified. But uh, we, fit, we, we know there are more, and there's some work going on to try to identify more of those sites. Uh, they're, they're in the kind of possession of the state forestry company. So they're reluctant to basically allowed too much of old woodland sites to be identified. Um, yeah, I'm just, again, in some of the sites that I would be involved with here, we have very ancient hazel coppice, very old hazel coppice. And um, I was just wondering, what is the best approach? Should they be just left? You know, we're, we're looking at a management plan in a very small, um, ancient woodland that has some very old hazel coppice and we're just trying to f figure should it be left alone you know because they're, they're so valuable in their own right as old ancient trees they're, they're overstood they haven't been coppiced in a long long time or should some coppicing be attempted on them to to bring more light in into the woodland again i know it's hard to say without seeing seeing the site Hey, but again, I think maybe 
maybe Jamie will be better placed to speak about this or more experience of public sites than, than I. It's not a common thing in a, as common a thing in, in Scotland, but I guess some of the things, a couple of observations I'd make is um, in order to get them back into being useful coppice sites, it might not, it would be quite a long process. So even if you were to recopy some of the overstood stools, their resultant regrowth wouldn't necessarily be of the form that you would hope for. And it maybe takes a few rounds before you then get the kind of products out of it that you would want. The other thing that I would say is, particularly given how little ancient woodland there is uh, in your neck of the woods, um, a risk of losing any old individual stem of hazel would, would be a risk. Um, particularly the hazel are, are well renowned for having um, an alkaline bark and having a really good sweet and a useful suite of lichens, for example, that are associated with them. So if you were to fell some of those old stems, you might lose quite a lot of the biodiversity within the, within the site. And what generally recommended on sort of West Coast sites in Scotland, where there has been past coppicing, um, both of oak and of hazel, is that the, if people want to set up coppicing, particularly if it's coppicing for craft workers and that sort of thing, and to, re, to um, reinvigorate the culture of that, that that's done on a fresh site, so on fresh plant, and then you set that up with coppicing in mind, but that the, particularly where the, if you have a very small ancient woodland resource, yeah, I'd be quite wary of, of felling too much of that. Um, uh, I think uh, that's a very good sort of synopsis there, because you've, you've, it sounds like with, the, with not so much to go at, you, you don't want to risk it. So um, my first thought is that you could you could try a few, but then it depends how many of a few there are. And then it's like, oh, you probably shouldn't do that then. But then it, it uh, you, 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 there, there'll be veterans or ancient trees in their own right as well already if they've been neglected copies. So if they've been left for a long time, they're, they're, they are important. And that I think, as Alan says, there, they'll have their own sort of lichens and whatnot that are associated with them. So that so there'll be, they'll be sort of very important from that point of view. But I guess you're looking to try and continue that longevity. So whether there is young growth on the trees or if there is, then one thing to do with, with your hazel is to, to sort of layer it and bring, bring a, a whip down and, and maybe continue the woodland that way or expand the woodland that way, because then you, you, you're cutting maybe a whip or two from it or, or sort of layering it down. And then, and then at least you're extending the woodland out without doing too much harm to the tree. But uh, yeah, I think to actually copy them fully would be risky, really. So yes, they, they might look at other ways if possible. Yeah. Jamie, could I just uh, come in there and say three things? One, could you talk about deer in relation to ancient coppice restoration? Yeah. Could you talk also about the service that we offer for the Woodland Trust in Cumbria at the moment? Um, and I think is available in other parts of England. And lastly, uh, after you've done, then I think Arwell wanted to come in about uh, UKFS. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi. Right. So, um, yes, and even so the deer thing, that's yeah. a very important one because you've, uh, uh, you could coppice your woodland, in, but it sort of aside from this situation in Ireland, perhaps, but you could run in and coppice your woodland and grand, it'll be on, on the way to a nice restored coppice. But uh, yes, you've got to be observant to what's what's uh, there that maybe wants to nibble your new shoots and whatnot. So yes, that's that's definitely something to be aware of. Um, yeah, I guess here in, in Cumbria, we seem to have um, a lot of deer and uh, it, it, it's, it's quite an issue. So control of, of that and sort of other herbivores and things that are coming in is, is important. So yes, um, but within, so within, within Cumbria, what we offer is uh, uh, to sort of assess sort of areas of ancient woodland and it actually includes ancient semi-natural woodland as well now that is under threat. So originally it was mainly just uh, the plantation on ancient woodland sites uh, but we do cover the ancient semi-natural woodland. So 
there can be threats within those such as well such as deer uh, or, or uh, herbivores and also the likes of rhododendron and whatnot um, but this would not necessarily be picked up initially as a, as a sort of a traditional plantation threat so that's uh, something that that uh, can now be assessed so um, yes that's that's those uh, that's two of them Neville was there a third uh, yeah, so I'll just w highlight one thing. So Zach Goldsmith, the forestry minister in England today, uh, launched the, um, uh, the f a small film on Sean the sheep planting the nine millionth tree in the National Forest. Made me laugh because I thought it was Sean the sheep eating his nine millionth tree rather than planting it. But there you go. I'll hand over to Arwell. Do you want to uh, ask? your point please hi everyone um thanks for tonight really good presentation um i was just um thinking you know legislation does help with the protection of ancient semi-natural woodland um to a degree i think it then comes down to the management choices cho choosing either to thin or to clear fell um or to to leave it alone i mean that's sort of um but in my opinion, I feel a managed woodland is better than an unmanaged woodland because it serves a purpose and it's, um, you know, it, it's um, more likely to stay, stay there in, in the centuries to come. Um, it's just up to um, the, the manager to, to decide what management controls you, you want to do there, um, especially with deer control as you mentioned yeah yeah i think that's that is very important yes because uh, there's a saying uh, in scotland that a wood that pays is a wood that stays and um i think uh, that sort of does say something but i think you're, you're right to say that it is up to the to the owner to sort of choose how best to do it and it's in it is in the ukfs uh definitely to 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 do the protection but there isn't the sort of designation as such i think that alan alluded to before it's so that isn't quite the same in in some ways so but yes i that's it sounds good that yes um i think unless anyone's got anything else burning we should finish there because it's 20 past eight and we may have other things to do apart from look at a computer screen apparently um, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a real pleasure to have you here and to um, to have you interact. Um, if you're interested in further woodland topics um, in the Cumbria region or otherwise, do sign up to our newsletter. And if you use social media, um, we always announce stuff on Twitter and Facebook um, and LinkedIn, if you're on there for work. Um, and we'd love to see you at another event. The next event on pause is going to be on the 12th of April. Um, that's not open for booking yet, but I'll open that soon. Um, and that's uh, a talk from George Peterkin on bats in ancient woodland uh, with an introduction. Uh, that's the recorded part of the evening. And then there'll be an introduction from Keith Kirby, um, a live introduction from Keith on woodland flora. So if, you, if, you, if you're interested in that, then keep an eye on our on our socials and sign up to our newsletter. Can, I, can, I, can I just big up the George Peterkin thing? I've seen the lecture before. I think it's just, he is like the, the god of woodland ecology and he, he, he is talking about Lady Well Park in uh, the Welsh borders that he's been doing research on for 50 years and just... It, it it's well it's a lovely slow place but just the the information within it is great sorry to interrupt claire i just wanted to do the heavy sell on it really <laughs> okay thanks so much everyone enjoy the rest of your evening thanks alan thank you alan thank you everyone thanks for listening folks enjoyed it cheers jamie cheers